Welcome to She's All Over the Place. You have just entered the Women Empowerment Series. We're focused on divine femininity in this series. And today I have a beautiful human being, artist from Venezuela. Her name's Maria Brito. She lives in New York City. She's a boss lady, powerhouse in the art world, collector. She has a new book coming out. She has, she's involved in fashion and she's here to make an impact today and add a lot of value in a cool, colorful, artistic way. So with no further ado, Maria, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Katie. I'm so happy to be here with you, finally. Yes, yes, finally. So um, great news. We just got the announcement about a couple of weeks ago um, from this platform that uh, in out of all podcasts for arts podcasts, um, 60 art podcasts for 2021. Um, she's all over the place is number 48. So yay! congratulations. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here with you talking about my very favorite thing in the world, art. I think everything is art. This piece of chairs art, this microphone, everything is just art. It's how we perceive it. And I want to know from you, what is art? for you? How do you perceive art? Let's go on an exploration. Yeah, well, actually, I want to point out that I am not an artist. I'm an art advisor. And what I do is I build art collections for people and I curate them. And uh, I became an art advisor after I was a corporate attorney and, and, and it was very miserable. That was not my calling. Ever since I was a child, I was actually an artist as a child. And that actually um, is one of those big things in my life that will probably haunt me forever, which is that I didn't pursue my passions because I had very strict parents growing up and very traditional and particularly my mother. And she was very adamant that I had to do something with my life and um, in her world, being an artist was not part of that, right? So I went to law school, I graduated, I, I came to New York and I worked in big law firms for many years until I couldn't do it anymore because I was really dying of sadness. And uh, I opened my company 13 years ago. And uh, today is one of the most recognized art advisories in the country and actually in the world. And I'm very pleased to have been able to do that transition because now I can teach people how to do that for themselves and where to find the strength to change careers or to open up new paths for them. And art for me is the definition of the ultimate definition of creativity because it has no boundaries. And artists are not in any way, shape or manner bound by convention or by things of reality. And so I think that they are the ultimate future makers as well, because since they can see things that nobody else can or that nobody else imagine and artists put them out there through whatever work, whatever medium they utilize. And that means they can envision what most people cannot. So for me, art is uh, the, the, the most transformative experience that any human being can partake of, no matter the medium, if it is a painting or if it is a movie or if it is a piece of um, a musical piece, anything like that is just the greatest and most beautiful and transformative power and, and moment that human beings have created in history beautiful beautiful and yeah. it's so wild because you said you were an artist and then you you transitioned to art advisor and for me I still look at you being an artist as an art advisor like that is still an art form um just from a different angle um um, yeah. yeah, I mean, your, your presence and your essence is just so beautiful and so colorful. And I just want to dive deep more into some stories. And, um, so who are you, some of your favorite, I guess, all-time artists, and then some artists that you're really keen on in today's world? I think that, well, you know, the, the, always the question of the today's artist is so complicated because I have so many and many, 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 right. But I think that, when you, I look back in history, there are people who have really impressed me and I admire them, how hard they worked and the things they did. And like, 
Leonardo da Vinci is one of them for being the ultimate inventor, entrepreneur, and master of mystery and curiosity and hard work and perseverance. And so I love him. I also love Picasso because he was prolific and intense. And he, I mean, he's so criticized because of the women and this and that, but he never really, he never said you're getting an angel or you're getting this saint. He was very clear about who he was and how he was coming. And what I admired about Picasso is uh the intensity with which he worked the work ethics that he had and the style that he created and how incredible he was each time each turn the you know he was he never was tired or um you know bored or complaining about his life he never said ah, i'm not today no I'm not doing that. Really? Do I have to do that? That kind of like, you know, millennial antic. I know he never did that. And so I'm a, I'm a big fan of his life and his, and he's everywhere. Really? He, like the, the way that he influenced the art world and the world at large through cubism is something that no other artist has done and probably nobody else will. I mean, it'll, we'll have other influences, but they, they, they will be different, right? And I think that in, I mean, there are so many other amazing artists that I could talk to you for the whole day, but I think in the contemporary space, I mean, there are so many incredible Black artists, you know, that for so long were not really named or talked about in the mainstream. I mean, there is like Micheline Thomas and there is... Nina Chanel Abney and uh, there is Kara Walker and um, you know all these strong black women artists who are now being collected by the MoMA and the Guggenheim and they are having international shows that are spectacular and they have something to say that is relevant and that is important and the message is deep so I have always been a huge proponent and fan of black artists, not just now, because it seems that people think it's fashionable. I have always been very, um, I've always felt very strong about their work. And in fact, for the past 13 years that I've had this business, I've, I've put them in the collections of most of my clients because I think that they were the underdogs and now they are uh, the darlings. And so it's very interesting to see how the market has changed and the art world for many, many years did not pay attention to them. And now they are just dying to have them. Yeah, I love, I love everything you're saying. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, which leads me to oh, um, being an art advisor now in the 21st century. What does that mean? How does it look in how, what are you looking for as an art advisor? So let's break that down. But what is the role of an art advisor for you in the 21st century? And what are you looking for? Well, listen, I'm in the role of advocacy because I advocate on behalf of the artists and, but I almost, but I work for my clients, right? Who are the collectors. And it's like, it's a lot of navigating this fine line between you're championing an artist and a gallery or a certain program or whatever. And, but you're also mindful of the interests of your clients and what they want and their taste is, and you want to protect their investments too, because although my clients mostly collect for pleasure and because they really love art and they want to live with art there, I have also responsibility to place things in their collection that I know that are going to retain value if not increase value, but at least retain it. So there is a lot of uh, being an art advisor is a little bit like being a financial advisor, but you have all the, the aesthetic components, the messaging, the background. It's a business of relationship because it just, the art market grew and grew and grew so much that it's, you've got to have all these very solid relationships with galleries and demonstrate that you're serious because since the demand is much bigger than the supply of art that people can get right now, 
from these galleries, etc. It only takes, you know, a handful of like people who can actually go what they want. And so that means you've got to have your hand in a million different places and your eyes in a different in, in a million different places to be able to also advocate for your client. Because like at the end of the day, you have to build a case. Why would your client be the best person to own this super coveted painting? And so I have to build all the cases for my for my clients. But yes, I'm in the business of advocacy with aesthetics and with relationships. And believe it or not, when I started this, this business, nobody really understood very well what I was doing. And uh, now it's so funny because like every, I, I run into young girls and they're like, you inspired me to become an advisor. And so I think that's cute because it was not really like a job and people thought it was like, you know, what is she doing? Um, well, I'm Great. pleased to say that it, it's a, re, it's a full-time job and it's very busy. Great. So you're a pioneer in this area. So what are some basic bu building blocks for someone wanting to start? What are some like maybe ethics, morals, and values, know thyself? What are some basic baseline things for someone who wants to go into the direction? Because you need to be an oak tree or else you're going to be swayed every which way. And then, you know, there's a the faith and the hope and the, 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 the illusion, but how do we check in? with other humans and, and what can we do to have a basic solid foundation, follow someone like you, um, you know, do this, don't do this. What are some basic things that one can do to want to deep dive into the art world of being an I, art advisor? Yeah, I think it's, first of all, it's really important to build solid relationships with the galleries because they are the gatekeepers of this inventory, if you will. And if you do not respect their rules, um, you know, you when you buy an artwork, you just cannot go and flip it at auction the next day, right? And so we have seen a lot of this, like there are groups of people doing a lot of chats on WhatsApp and whatever. On, they have groups on on the back, you know, uh, on the DMs of, of Instagram. And, and so like sometimes they pull resources together. They buy something that is kind of like a little bit of like they couldn't buy individually. They buy it and then you know, a month after it shows up at Sotheby's or Crazy's or whatever, because they know that particular artist is hot. And so that actually annihilates your chances to buy something else again from that particular gallery. But people figure out ways of doing it, right? So I think that you to do the job that I do and be taken seriously, you have to make sure that you vet your clients really well and don't just go with someone because they are offering you this and this and that. I think you are the one who sets the parameters, right? As as your as a business owner, you want to work with people who are very clear about your own rules and your own boundaries and your own parameters. But you also have to know them. And um, I think that the only time in my life in this thirteen years that I have been kind of hurt by a client is because I didn't pay attention to my intuition. Because I knew that client wasn't right. And I still went with that. Luckily, it was like 12 years ago. So the damage was done, but it wasn't as severe as it would have been later, right? Because now I have more experience. And so I think that uh, people who want to do this job have to pay attention to their intuition, be very well versed in the in the art of making friends with these galleries and keep the relationship alive with them and being nice and kind, which is, I mean, it sounds like, bleh, of course, but, you know, people are not nice and kind that much anymore. So especially if in the throes of this pandemic, a lot of people have lost their social skills, if not because they were not that social before, you know, and then suddenly you're in this kind of mess, right, where you don't have, you're not interacting with people in real life as much. So, um, and, and I think that, that the, the other skill that is very valuable is to really go the extra mile in the learning phase, right? I mean, if you know that you're going to have to check 50 exhibitions in New York City, don't go to 30, go to 50, you know what I mean? And like, if you need to learn and, and, and you need to read and supplement, just do the, it, it's um, one of the things that actually shocks me the most in, in the today's world is that the bar is so low because people are so lazy and they just are winging it, right? So if you do extra effort, you're gonna shine. 
And uh, the good news is that the extra effort, if you're passionate about what you're doing, which I'm assuming you are, because being an art advisor is amazing and it pays really well if you're good at it, but you've got to love what you're doing, right? I mean, it's, it's this is about looking at art all day long and in selling. And so you have to have the skills of like looking at art all day long, sifting through all the things that are good and bad and being able to convince your clients that what you're selling them is good. And so that comes with trust and time and putting that extra effort that I'm telling you, because sometimes you know, I mean, I live in New York City. Sometimes it's 30 or 20 degrees outside. I don't want to go to the gallery, but guess what? It's my job and I'm going to have to do it, you know, because I want to give my clients the extra effort that I went there. I saw it in person. I met with the galleries. I met with the artists. I saw it turn it upside down. And I, and I want to be able to give that to my clients. So I think that's kind of in a nutshell. Yeah. And then, so, I mean, now with your successful career and who you are, you get invitations for this opening, come here, go here, and everything's curated for you, woven through, but you built it from the ground up. So um, I don't know if it's happening right now because of the what's been going on in the world, but um, for years, it's just every single Thursday, the galleries open their doors and you're like a kid in a candy store, like free wine and just jumping around, meeting all the artists and seeing all the beautiful, cool art and meeting people in the scene. So um, is that happening right now because of what's going on? It, it is. It is. Um, it's not every Thursday, but it's almost like once a month or once every three weeks. And uh, people go. I don't I don't think there's that much bad wine anymore. I think it's just people go from one gallery to the next to see you know, the new exhibitions and to mingle and to see the artist. And yes, it is. I mean, you know, New York has gotten a really high level of immunization and people are excited to be back on the streets and go out. I mean, perhaps certain galleries are rotating their shows with less frequency. If they did it, let's say five weeks, now they are maybe extending it to six or eight and things like that. But yes, there mm. are openings happening everywhere in Manhattan. And uh, it's a, it's, it's a joy. It's a great thing to have that back. And Definitely. the illusion someone might be thinking, would they see someone like you there doing that? Or would you go during the day? Do you stay away from kind of like the public mass crowds? Or do you still sometimes go and show up and network in those settings? I, I try to avoid the crowds because then I cannot see, right? So, oh. I mean, if I'm, that's the thing, right? If I am not able to see with the space and whatnot, I mean, I, the only reason at what I, why I would go at night and, you know, like the openings are usually from six to eight is because the artist is a friend of mine and I want to be there and I want to be celebrating with the artist and I want to show up and say I came, you know, Dope. so, but I'm usually there early during the day or the day before if the show is installed because I'm doing my job. And so I also don't know, but if you, I don't know if you know, but um, 90% of those shows are already sold because everything happens with a PDF that gets sent, right? And so this is how this whole crazy demand supply dynamic that I was talking to you before has grown exponentially because it's so easy to send a PDF and it's a whole lot more efficient than bringing your people in, right? And so my clients don't need to go see anything in person. I do it because I want to see them in person, right? But they don't even have to do that because they trust that if I send them a PDF or a JPEG of, of a painting or of a sculpture, it's actually what I'm saying it is, you know? Speaking of JPEGs in the 21st century, I've been in heavily involved in the NFT space since 2018. And I personally released my first NFT in March um, when I released my poetry book, uh, A Lover's Fairy Tale. And uh, I definitely want to dive deep into uh, your book and um, and talk about JPEGs, NFTs, non fungible tokens, and yes. um, and how you are with the space of the galleries. What you're talking about the galleries and how you know for people who are learning um, NFTs as a way for artists to take power back. And so instead of a gallery getting a percent, they get the percent every time it's sold and then you can do unlockables and stuff. And so how do you feel 
with that and how are you shape shifting in the 21st century of NFTs in the art space? I think that NFTs are one of the most revolutionary and pivotal moments in art history because of all the reasons you said an artist having control of who are the owners, how much money they're going to get every time it gets sold. And uh, also the idea of having a metaverse coming up and the NFT not just being a, a an image, a flat image, but have, but that image has a lot of other functions or uh, purposes once we are more into the metaverse space is absolutely fascinating and important. And it's important because we, uh, or I particularly, am always very interested in the future. I don't want to stay where I am. I want to evolve with how the world is, or I want to be even ahead of the world. And I also think that the blockchain is going to allow for also authentication of tangible artworks and will help tremendously with traceability and also, you know, borrowing for museums and, you know, things like that, because it'll lend so much transparency, hopefully, to a system that is very opaque as it is and where there are really no way of finding who owns what and where is it and, and things like that. So it's not only just the digital aspect of, of the NFT, but it's also how an NFT accompanies a physical artwork and, and how much safety and security and also what you said about adding royalties to that NFT. I'm not sure how's that gonna be implemented, rolled out, once it is always available for a physical intangible piece of art, I'm not sure, but I think that it will give a lot more power to the artist, like you said. I mean, it's not just going to benefit the gallery or the, or the person who originally bought it. And I think the auction houses have done a tremendous job. And they are always ahead um, of the curve because the mandate of the, of the auction house is to make money. And so they are always going to figure out how to do that. Galleries are a little bit more conservative because they feel that they, and it's the truth is that they have different interests. The galleries want to also protect the careers of the artists. So they don't want to go too fast too soon because they don't want to crash and burn. You know, it's like they don't want to do that. So the auction houses have less of an interest if they crush and burn because they won't. And they also don't care that much for the career of an artist, but they are happy to provide platforms and marketing and uh, technology and things like that because that is at their disposal and they can do it. So I always take auction houses with a little bit of a, you know, it's like I like them and I don't because they also have created this monster, right? I mean, if, if auction houses wouldn't exist, we wouldn't have like, you know, $500 million, you know, Salvatore Mundi by Da Vinci that we don't even know if it was Da Vinci who made it, right? And so, and we wouldn't have all this young artists getting to like a million dollars when their career is like a three-year-old career, right? So, so we really have- quick, just for people who are tuning in, Name some auction houses that come for, to the top oh, of your mind. Sotheby's. I mean, the, the three big auction houses are Sotheby's, Christie's, and Phillips. Phillips is the smaller one uh, of those three, and but those are the most relevant right now. And and the three of them are very involved with NFTs. And uh, and Sotheby's just also released its own metaverse space. Uh, for now, it's just a screen. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a website. And what I'm saying is it's flat. It's not something that yet feels like 3D or that we are immersed in it. But I think that they they have uh, all the technological advances that are bringing, you know, us to the future. And so yeah. my friend, um, Carlos Luna James, he just did a collaboration with Sotheby's two weeks ago. He was on season three of the podcast. So anyone who wants to tune in and check out that episode, um, it was a really awesome en- um, episode talking about NFTs in the space. So thank you. And then, so will you, um, like artists you represent, you'll re- maybe represent their physical piece. 
but then um, also the digital piece and then sell it to a collector. And then maybe, I mean, everything's negotiable with art and in life. So maybe then someone says, oh, okay, I want to keep the physical, but I'm just going to sell the NFT. So maybe someone wants to keep the physical, but just the NFT can keep reselling. That could yeah. be an option yes, for you in the near that, future. I mean, it is an option for people. I think that um, in the past, couple of months or or three months uh, Damien Hurst did something like that but it was very interesting because he released uh, a bunch of works on paper with dots that were accompanied by an NFT but he and the prices were really low for a Damien Hurst I mean it was not for free but it was like five thousand ten thousand dollars I don't know and then um but he made a he made the, the buyers sign a contract where a year from now they have to choose if they want to keep the physical work or the NFT. So this is a very interesting way to play with people. And Damien has always been incredible and a provocateur and an innovator. So I so he actually it's not exactly what you're saying, but it's a similar kind of play where he is saying okay what do you think it's it'll worth more money do you, you want to keep the nft or you want to keep the physical damien hurst dots um you know on your on your wall so that is a gamble and i think that you know maybe maybe people bought two and they're going to keep one nft and one paper you know i don't know but i think it's a it's a cool way but what you're saying is is also going to be an interesting thing because but it, but it presents a problem with with ownership rights, right? Because one is, okay, you have the physical painting and it's hanging on your living room and then somebody else has the NFT and they just have rights to blockchain. So it'll be um, something that will probably require jurisdiction, I mean, jurisprudence. So like, you know, judges will have to assess what's what, but for now, it sounds so exciting and weird. And at the same time, um, kind of like the subject of sci-fi movies and things like that, because imagine somebody is going to be like trafficking the NFT and things like that, you know? So yeah, I think it's very who's cool. gonna who's gonna make the rules and like right who can go left, who can go right. Yeah, super, super, super exciting. Um, I think the space is just a, a lot of fun. Um, so let's talk about your new book. Um, yeah, yes, please. I mean, so how excited. Long, how long did it take you to write it? And well, it took me, I think, um, like almost it's like my life, I say, right. But I, it, it took me about, about a year and a half to write it. And, uh, it's coming out in March, March 15th. Uh, 2022 is published by Harper Collins and is called How Creativity Rules the World. And uh, it's a deep dive into art history, entrepreneurship, business, psychology, science, data, intuition. And uh, I think it's my best work so far, really. I'm so proud of that book. And it is a manual for life. I, I want the people who get this book to refer to it time and time again because it's not just something of the moment it's a book where I give my best strategies for to keep my business relevant I give all my and and I match all this same skills to points in history where artists have done the same or entrepreneurs ranging from Steve Jobs to Shonda Rhimes um, have the same skill sets. So Love I think her. it's kind of like, yeah. And I think it's very important that one thing is we do have to really end the myth of the starving artist because I know so many artists I've worked with more than 450 artists in different capacities, right? I mean, they, they have done commissions for my clients. I have done fashion accessories with many of them in collaboration. We have, uh, I've interviewed them for, you know, TV. I've like written about them in magazines and newspapers. So I know artists for sure. And I would say like 80% of the artists that I know are very well off. Um, and they are not crying and they are not like rolling around saying they're starving artists. They don't even consider that term, right? 
And so it's an occupation like any other. I know starving lawyers, I do. And I do know starving fashion designers because they are not that great or they don't have the mentality. Maybe they are, but they don't have the mentality that you, you don't have to feel dirty about money or making money or say, I don't know anything about money and that's not my mindset. I think that if you're good at something, you should be compensated for it. And so this book merges the worlds of business and art, and it's equally good for an entrepreneur or for an artist because it comes from all those angles. And the connecting blue of everything is I have everything backed up by science. So all the psychologists who have, you know, gathered information and analyzed data and come up with a study that says, you know, this is what needs people need to be creative, or this is what people need to see the future. Or this is, so I've gathered all those studies and connected them to both the business and the artistic part. So people have like a buffer in the middle say, well, I'm a business person, I don't believe this, or I'm a artist, I don't believe this, but hey, here in the middle, there is all this science that is actually proving that what she's claiming in that book is true. So I, I hope this. to really, I hope to make a difference in my readers. I hope that they can turn their ideas into gold and manifest and materialize things and never stay stuck in where they are. That's really also the point of the book. I give so many strategies. It has 25 chapters that are rich, rich with history and information. And, uh, you know, I just have a desire to leave this world in a better shape than how I found it when I came yeah. in. I mean, you're speaking my language. It's the same, same. The fundamentals, the baseline, the mechanics, the foundations to connect and bridge so people understand and make you a great impact. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. You so much. Um, and is it available on audio too for people? Who yes, to there audio? will be an audio book. I mean, if you come to my website, mariabreda.com, there will be a page with a book that has, I'm going to be releasing bonuses throughout the pre-order. So come and come often and check because I will give all these free bonuses for people who come and buy the book and present a, you know, a copy of the receipt or, or a screenshot of the receipt. So it's going to be and anywhere where books are sold from Amazon to Barnes and Noble to, uh, you know, all the independent stores that are so very important. They are very important to me. I grew up going to all these independent stores. So it's very, very important that we support them. And there's going to be an audiobook also. So Great. We will have every, and that is going to be hardcover, ebook and audio. So we have all the formats. And great. And then uh, will you be reading the audiobook? Yes with your lovely voice. Amazing. It's so good. So good. <laughs> and then well, thank I, um, you. Yeah, of course. Um, all the um, social media links and uh, the links for the book and everything will be in the show notes for, um, you know, the person tuning in. We'll make sure those links are there for you. Um, thank you. Oh, yeah, definitely. And then huh, I just kind of like want to reset and kind of go deeper. And um, um, is there something that comes to your heart and soul to share with the struggling artist um, in addition to, you know, receiving your book, but is there a mm -hmm. message to uh, artists out there who can um, make an impact, take more actionable steps for their dreams, goals, and desires to make them rooted in reality? Yes, I think it's very important to be mindful of the here and now. And you are doing it, for example, with participating of NFTs and doing things that belong to this moment. And I think that one thing is for any artist who's listening to pay attention to that space and not be afraid of exploring it, because I think although material things and physical things will never disappear, I think it's very, very important to explore this right now because it's the right time. It's like, you know, it's the beginning of everything. Like the beginning of the internet was slow and it was weird and we had a dial up and we didn't really know how to use it. So this is the beginning of that space of the NFTs. And I think that people have to at, at least experiment. I'm not saying, you know, just move on to that. I'm saying try. And another thing is to be in a position of power for themselves. I think that 
ever since the Renaissance, artists have never wielded so much power as they, as they are doing right now. It is a very important profession that is highly regarded. Brands are looking for artists. Uh, you know, companies are looking for artists to help them redesign systems and um, to give them advice. And the, even the government is always looking for new ways to revamp certain things and they are listening to what artists have to say. So it's not a good, it doesn't do anybody good to look at yourself like less than or that you are not important or not contributing enough or that you should have gone and done it. I mean, I think that once you are an artist, it's, it's a vocation. And once it's a vocation, it's something that you can't do anything else but be an artist. And that's very powerful because it means that you're not a sellout, right? It means like, it not like I did, like I had to do what my mother wanted me to do. But I think that it's for, for artists who are creating things with their hands, it's almost impossible to go by any day without creating something with your hands, right? And I think that's very, is very beautiful and important, but also know that there is, there is economic power, that there's true economic power in your hands. And, you know, at the end of the day, you don't depend on anybody to produce things, right? You do, of course, are in an ecosystem where you're going to need somebody to buy what you're producing. But I think that when you have that level of independence, that you can do whatever you want with your hands or produce or write or film or, you know, you start developing a lot of self-confidence. And that's not something that anybody else in any other profession can because they will depend on many other factors and things to come together. But I think that when once you know and understand the power of what it means to be an artist, you should capitalize on it to begin with and also not struggle that much. I mean, I'm not, it's not that I'm not empathetic to people's struggles and positions where, you know, they are not making the money that they want or they are not getting the opportunities. I am empathetic of that. And but it takes time and persistence. And we live in the age of acceleration. So what it used to be a 50 year, you know, career span this to see the glory now is five. So I want people to actually be very mindful of that, mm -hmm. that, it, you know, and also, you know, be honest too. I mean, I've, I've had artists who come to me and say, you know, I'm not having this opportunity this, or, you know, and I say, because your art is not there yet. It's not that it's not going to be, but it takes time, maturity, practice, man. That's the other thing. You've got to be, whatever you do, dedicate yourself. It's about doing things. It's about hours and hours of developing your skill. And, uh, and that takes, you know, time. And uh, it takes time and dedication and focus. You cannot be doing one thing and at the same time, playing Fortnite and uh, listening to a podcast at the same time and, you know, drinking a beer is like way too much, right? And that takes away from, from that level of nuances and expertise at your work. Mm. So I think I've given you a few nuggets here of what people I should love be doing. It. I love it. I love it. I really do. And, um, you know, if, even the people who are artists, you know, cause I'm around artists my whole entire life as well. And um, they still have the struggle of, of someone saying that thing that you don't want to hear, you know, or, or, or the mom or the dad or someone and to like cut the umbilical cord and not people please. And to truly not care what others think to be in your power to, be who you are and walk the life of an artist. Um, even when you're doing that, there's still going to be people. We just have to be aware if we attune and listen to it or know to tune it out and keep listening to people like you and people who are going to be mentors to lead us in the good direction who understand what you're saying. And it's important. Yeah. Um, and no, it's like, uh, it's sacred. It's very sacred. And to take it seriously as a business, as it's, business you know it is art is a business it's like show business it's not I mean it's show art show art yeah let's show you the art let's see the art but it's yeah it's a business and 
as an art advisor, I, I love all the value you're bringing. Thank you. Um, wrapping it up here, like honing yes. it in. Um, if people, you know, want to get in touch with you or show you their art, um, and maybe get mentored by you. Um, I don't know if, yeah. you know, it, how people can contact you and show you their Instagram or, Hey, what do you think about my art? And for any, do you ever, I mean, it's difficult because if it's someone you don't know and you say something that might hurt their feelings or they might right. post in backlash. So it's, it's a fine line, but how can people in a safe space, um, ask people like you, like, can you look at the trajectory of where my art is and where it's going? Well, I have a form in my website, mariabrito.com, B-R-I-T-O.com. And I have a form and I receive messages, you know, all the time. And so if I, if I feel intrigued, because I also, like you said, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. So when I see something that is not necessarily in my wheelhouse, it doesn't mean it's bad. I'm saying it's not for me. I may not answer. And also remember, I mean, I work 12 hours a day, right? I mean, and I have kids to feed and a mortgage to pay in the most expensive city in the world. So I don't necessarily have the time to answer every note and every message that comes my way, but not because I'm a bitch, but because I really am busy, like most professionals are, right? And I cannot, you know, sometimes I, I, I think for myself, if these guys knew how many of this I get, and like sometimes are like this long and complicated question. As I said, if they knew how many of this I get. And if I were to spend, you know, like my days writing that those answers and meaningful, important answers, then I will be never able to do my job and pay my bills and feed my kids. Right. So I think that um, it's a shame that there is not a. A, a, a job that is for that right I mean like that mentorship for artists but also it's a difficult career thing because you would have to ask the artist to pay you and they're always crying that they have no money so you know it's a very it's a catch-22 thing but um I mean yes is the form is there and if you want to reach you know out and I typically answer uh, the ones that I call my attention. So. Well, just brain, just ha going through this brainchild, this thing, maybe someone tuning in will listen, will start a community. Maybe there's already communities out there. Maybe people will start talking about that. Maybe there is a platform or maybe someone will create different platforms to make that happen, that in between. So it's not all or nothing. So there's that emotional support and questions along the way. Maybe that's what the start of this communication is more of that maybe it's not all on you but maybe you're a vessel for it to be so right. or maybe it's right. sowing a seed for other people in your space in the art world as a collective to maybe make a community platform for that for the desiring artists who maybe have insecure questions or something and and don't have the budget but it's more of a communal thing I don't know I, I think that I think that's a great idea so if anybody wants to start let me know and I'll give you some ideas. But I think that what we are up against is that we live in a world of automatic things and we live in a world of big communities and aggregation, right? And when you have those questions that you, you could have as an artist, you need one human being to answer back to you, not a machine in Bangalore, not like, you know. Right. So totally. th that's, that's where the challenge is, is that... And also I know that artists are never really satisfied with one answer. So there'll be another question and there'll be another question, right? Mm. So this is almost like being a therapist without being a therapist. And uh, Maybe there needs to be more art therapists. <laughs> <laughs> there, should be like a, there should be a whole category for artists who see therapists. That's a good funny. A, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a very, very fun chat. And please let everyone know, um, you know, one last time, any ways that they can plug in with you and they will be in the show notes. Yes, it's mariabrito.com. Maria, as it sounds, B as in boy, R as in Rose, I as in Island, T as in Tom, O.com. Wonderful. Congratulations on your new book. And I, I look forward to being with you one-on-one uh, -on -one in New York City yes. in the near future. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Cool. Thank you, Maria. Everyone, thank you for tuning in to She's All Over the Place. And we'll see you next week with another powerful conversation about the divine femininity, women empowerment, and how we're taking actionable steps together. Thank you.